Welcome back, everybody. My name is Tim. This is another Real Ideal Gear live stream. And uh, we're coming. Hey, Craig, how's it going? Nice to see you on time. You know, as a former teacher, you always have a special place in your heart for students who show up on time with a pencil, um, having brushed their teeth and a few other things. But it's uh, Craig, it's nice to see you here. And we'll get started. And uh, I'm always, I want to be punctual. I want to respect the time of people who come in and out. This is not something that uh, I expect anybody to be here the entire time. So I just keep going. And when you show up, you show up. And I'm glad you do. Um, otherwise, uh, we're going to get started. We're going to start off with, uh, let's see here. Let me pull up the slide. We're going to start off with everyday carry. Now, I did not give a lot of time for the everyday carry photos to come in. So um, I'm going to start off with my updated everyday carry. Now, this seems like a lot, but this is what I carried last week. Um, and so these are all the things there. There's my... My concealed carry is not on here. I don't put that on there ever. Um, that is just not something I'm going to share with anybody in the public. So, so that that aside, this is the rest of the stuff that was in my pockets. Now I didn't have you know three watches on and two knives and or four watches on. I had one watch on, one knife. But this was the cumulative things that I carried for the week. So we'll go through this one real quick, and then at the end of this podcast or podcast live stream, we'll talk about the update on the ultimate flashlight. I had this on there uh, as a topic last month. Um, put a challenge out there for everybody and anybody who heard the, the live stream to help me find the ultimate flashlight. And to me, the ultimate flashlight is one that articulates and all the other stuff. We'll get to that at the end. That's kind of the uh, icing on the cake, if you ask me. But uh, let's start off with an everyday carry update. And uh, I do change my everyday carry. And this is something that when it comes down to what I have in my pockets, I try to streamline things and I've gone through a bunch of iterations. I used to carry um, a multi-tool on my belt because I always wear a belt. One, I probably should have the belt on there uh, for everyday carry because the, the number one reason I wear a belt is not because my pants are going to fall off. It's because it's a first aid tool. Um, it's also a restraint if you want to use it as a restraint. But primarily for me, it's a, it's a first aid tool. So my belt should be on there. I don't have it on there. But Otherwise, uh, my everyday carry does change a little bit, has evolved over the years, and I've kind of pared things down a little bit. I've kind of refined. I've always carried a knife. I've always had a, a watch. I've always had my keys, obviously. Um, and then the flashlight thing is kind of relatively new in the past, I don't know, four years or so, five years. Um, the uh, Swiss Army knife, uh, that's, that's the Huntsman up there, the Black Huntsman uh, scales on there. That's a new as of this past, man. I would say eight months, nine months, I switched over to a Swiss Army knife. And that to me has been a huge, huge shift because now my um, my uh, multi-tool is no longer on my belt. I have a smaller, obviously I have the smaller tool there. Now when I'm working, doing lawn mowing maintenance, I have that on as part of my toolkit on my belt. So I have a whole other everyday carry for my mowing. But let's go through this real quick. Um, so the knives I have on there, I have a send cut. I don't remember what the model is on that one. Uh, it's a it's a button lock. I'm getting into button locks. I think they're great. It just is an easier way to uh, to close. Opening is about the same. I use the thumb stud or the flipper, um, but the button lock closing is just so much better. I'm not. I don't have my thumb in the way with a frame lock um, or a liner lock. That's one thing that kind of bothers me. I actually cut my thumb uh, three weeks ago on one of those, uh, one of the videos I just did, the large EDC carry knives, um, the uh, Tucson, it closed on me a little bit too quick. And I did not have my thumb up against the uh, the base of the blade and it came down and caught me on the knuckle of my thumb. So it's the way it goes. Um, but I do like the button lock. I think the button lock's a great, great invention. So that's a send cut button lock. And that is also the Civivi baby banter. And I started carrying that one last week and I was like, oh man, I really do like a small knife in my pocket like that. So I wore that one the most, I think six days, the five days of the week with that one. And I've started to wear the uh, Send Cut now from last week into this week. Um, I just, I like a bigger blade because I have the small blade on the Swiss Army knife. So if I have to do, you know, open boxes or something like that, I've got that there. So the, the larger blade is for larger tasks, more blade specific, heavy duty uh, things. Wallet. Uh, this is a change from a year and a half ago. I went to a, a really slim down wallet. I really had to make some tough decisions, got rid of a bunch of cards that were not even necessarily credit cards. They were just cards for certifications or my range card, all that kind of stuff was in there. So I got rid of that, slimmed it down to this. 
And actually, I would never go back. Um, I just carry the the minimum number of credit cards, cash, identification, business cards. Um, I just used my Costco card. I I have a Costco card in there. I use it to scrape the windshield off, the frost off the windshield. That's about the only thing I ever use it for. But that's why I have it in there because you know when you need it, you need it. And you need a card that you need a card that you don't you want to damage, and that's one of them. So. Um, so there's the knives. Now watches. Um, I, I just did a review. It's coming out here. I think it's Thursday on the glycine airman. And then I've got that Sugis that just came in. Beautiful watch. Wow. Uh, 1901 movement. Actually it's a 1903 movement because it has a date complication and it also has a moon complication on there. Really, really nice watch. I really like it a lot. Um, and then a Casio, that's the DBC 32. Yeah, we're going to talk about that one a little bit later with the GMTs, and you're going to find out why. Um, and then the Zello Swordfish Ember, which is just phenomenal. I have it on right now. I was at the gym working out, and I had it on. And I, I, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal watch. Um, so there's the kind of the watches I wore last week. Uh, dress watch here and there. I wore that kind of around the house, wore to church. Um, and then I have the, uh, the Airmen and the... The two divers, and then I, I actually wore the Casio. I love wearing that Casio calculator watch. So I don't know if anybody out there wears a Casio calculator watch, but I'm beginning to really like the DBC32, the larger of the of the two basic styles of Casio calculator watches. They're really comfortable, really comfortable. Um, and this one has a nice big display on it too, so I like that. The review's coming up. I'm I'm going to get to that one. That you'll watch that review. It's I think it's going to be interesting. I had I bought four of them, four different types, um, and uh, we're going to go through and, and do a throwdown between two of the four, and uh, yeah, it'll be fun. Um, flashlights. Okay, so this is what I carried for flashlights, and uh, we'll get to the flashlight part at the end, the ultimate flashlight. But I did carry the Ace Beam at the top up there, the H6. That's one I've been carrying for a long time. I just love its magnetic base. It has the right angle uh, light on it, and the... Uh, the switch is on the top, and it's pretty straightforward to operate. It has the uh, the two-way uh, hook or the two-way uh, clip on it, so you can clip it two different directions. But look at the keys. I, the key to me is on my keys, and I started to not carry the ace beam in my pocket last week, and I was just carrying the flashlight on my keychain, which I've been carrying that for a long time. Uh, let's see here. What's the name of this? The frog. The Lumatop. Lumatop frog. I have it on my keys right next to me here. That is a phenomenal flashlight. Very small, bright. It's not a thousand lumens or anything like that, but it's, I want to say it's like 400 lumens, which is for that size, it is smaller than a longer, larger size key. It is shorter than that. It is a great little flashlight. That red light that you see in the picture there, that's on all the time. So if you set your keys down in the dark, it's illuminated all the time. Now the downside is, charge that that uh, flashlight more frequently you gotta maintain it so keep an eye on that maintain it but that's one that i've been carrying and i've actually stopped carrying the ace beam as much because it's like why am i doing that i've got a flashlight on my phone i've got a flashlight here i've got a flashlight in my truck or the, whatever vehicle i'm in i've got a flashlight in there so I, I don't need to have my pockets chocked full of flashlights so i think i'm going to limit the times that i have the ace beam with me um, and more or less it's when i go on longer drives you know, not just running errands around town. So <clears throat> that to me, um, that's kind of my everyday carry for the past. Oh, the handcuffs. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> yeah, that's probably one that everybody picked up on right away. The handcuffs. What the, you know, what are you doing with handcuffs? Um, as a former cop, it's one of those things. It's like, I'd rather handcuff somebody than shoot them. So <laughs> I do have handcuffs with me. I actually have handcuffs in the vehicles that I drive. Um for that reason, you know, it's one of those things where uh, sometimes restraining somebody, having the right restraints for somebody who's out of control is the is probably the most important thing rather than pulling your gun out and saying, you, you know, follow my instructions, all that stuff. So just walk up and handcuff them. Um, so I do have handcuffs. Now, that being said, notice the keys. If you have handcuffs, you better dang well have a cuff key with you. And you better know how to use the double the double lock on there because uh, you can get yourself into some serious civil problems by not knowing how to double lock handcuffs so they don't continually um, ratchet closer and closer. You can you can have some serious nerve damage on somebody who's got handcuffs on and they're not put on properly. So 
if you do take handcuffs with you, you, you need to know how to operate them, practice them um, with a willing person, willing partner, whatever. Make sure you have the key. I have keys everywhere. All, all my keychains, I have a handcuff key. Um, I went in to change my uh, tires. I got new tires on my truck and I, I handed the guy my keys and he looked at me and said, oh, cuff key, huh? He smiles and starts laughing. I said, yeah, cuff key. Um, and I think he was thinking like, oh, in case I ever I get handcuffed, it's like, no, no, it's because I carry the cuffs. Um, and at the time I was a reserve deputy too. So it was, yeah, whatever. Um, so if you have the cuffs, make sure you have multiple keys in different locations. Always have them on your keychain. If you're going to be responsible to carry the cuffs, you better dang well have the cuff key. If you don't have the cuff key, you know, put the cuffs away and don't even bother with them. Um, so... There's my everyday carry. Now that was last week, and this I what I what do I rotate out? I rotate out the knives. Obviously, I rotate out watches. I wear I wear a couple watches a day, probably. Um, I wear specifically um, sweat ready type watches to the gym. Um, I wear dressier watches when I know I'm just casually sitting around the house or I'm going out to eat or wherever a date, whatever church. Um, and then the other watches kind of just kind of fill in the blanks. Um, at night, I always wear a watch that I can read at night. So whether it's a good loom watch and I've tested it for overnight use, or it is a Casio with a good light. And there's some Casios that don't have good lights. And I'm not going to get into that because it really drives me nuts that they don't have a good light. So there is the everyday carry for me for one week, minus the concealed carry, which is another component to that. And I have a couple of options for that too. So I would highly recommend if you do the concealed carry thing, get out there, practice monthly, bi-monthly, um, you, you know, do your do, do your due diligence when it comes to conceal carry as well. And I would again, you know, you don't need to have handcuffs. You can get the uh, zip ties; uh, those are those work well too. So uh, then you don't have to worry about keys. You just have to have a knife to to cut them off. But remember that those continually tighten down, and you can cut off circulation and do some some damage. So know what you're getting yourself into before you put them in your pocket or in your carry bag, whatever you decide to carry. So um, and also one thing about cuffs: there's two kinds. Hinges and links. Hinges are better for pain, uh, pain compliance control, by far. Not even, not even question. The chain, the link ones are, they're good. They're, there's nothing wrong with the restraint side of it. But if you're, you know, maneuvering and, and manipulating somebody around with them, it's the, it's the, uh, the hinged ones that work the best for that. All right, moving on. We're going to get to the GMTs now. Any, any comments or questions? You go ahead and put them in the comment section. I will try to catch them as we go through. And we've got a few more people joining in. So um, let's get into the GMTs. Now, I just put out today, it actually came out today, a uh, GMT, kind of a primer, primer. I don't know how you pronounce it. I'm a teacher. I don't know how to pr pronounce the word primer, primer. Um, but the GMT, let's get this a little bit bigger here. I'll take the small, the small window. I have four GMTs. Um, and I have a bunch of dual time. Okay. Dual time is where you like Casio's basically the digital watches where you punch in the time. Um, so GMTs generally are analog from my experience, my knowledge on this. And when it comes down to GMTs, I think there's some important things you have to keep track of. And if you want the more detailed look at this, go to the video that, that went out today. Um, and it's, uh, I think very helpful. It goes through the two big types, which is your traveler GMT and your caller or office GMT. Uh, the traveler sometimes is called the true GMT. Um, and that's different, a different mechanism or different mechanism. I keep saying that now, I've got that stuck in my head. It's a different movement or caliber than the caller or office GMT, okay? The, and the functions really come down to what happens when you are adjusting the time, the GMT hand, that they're, they're different that way. So what I found when I, the first GMT watch that I purchased, let me think back here. It was, it's either the Borealis or the Nighthawk. Those were one of the, I think it was, uh, I think I got the Nighthawk first. And the Nighthawk confused me. I didn't realize, and it was a GMT. And if you look at the, the, the Nighthawk, we'll get a single picture of it up here real quick. Um, that's not it. Where did it go? Maybe I don't have it up here. No, I don't have it up here. Well, isn't that something? All right, well, we'll go back to this. So if you look real close, you have to zoom in on yourself here. Um, you'll see that there is a, a dual hemispherical uh, hemis uh, semicircle on the left-hand side going from the 12 o'clock down to the 6 o'clock and then over to the 9. And you have a red uh, red numbers and you have white numbers in there. And you'll see the tw 22 and the 24. You'll see the 10 and the 12. And those are just underneath the 12 
hour marker. And then if you look towards the center, the center pinion there, you'll see a white airplane and a red airplane. Okay, the white airplane reads the AM time. So that's if you're going 24 hour time, it's 100 hours, 200 hours, 300 hours, 10 hundred hours, 1100 hours, and so on. The red airplane is the after 1200 hours, which is your one, your 1300, 1400, and so on. And that's the numbering that they use. You can't see it because I didn't put the right picture up here, but that's your 24 hour time. So as the time goes around, those airplane, that one hand, it's just one hand, it's just utilizing both ends, goes around once in a 24-hour period, all right? So it can go make a full circle once. As it does that, you know, obviously 12 hours go by, then the opposite color airplane goes in there, and so you know what AM and PM is. So that was the first one that I got, and that's really, I'm explaining, that's all I knew other than how to set the time and the date, which really frustrated me because um, you turn it one way and you turn the hour hand, and it only goes clockwise. And if you turn the crown the opposite direction, this is the first position. If you turn it the opposite direction, it adjusts the date, right? So it's frustrating that way, um, but it was one that I, I liked. Then I got the Borealis. The Borealis is a collar GMT. This is a pretty straightforward one. Um, really liked it. And uh, this was, I knew about this time that my oldest son was gonna be deployed overseas, I think. Uh, at this time, I think I knew that he was going to be deployed overseas. And so I was like, I'm going to get myself a GMT, an actual GMT that's really easy to use. So I got the Borealis. And uh, this is a collar GMT, which means that your first position on the crown, you adjust the date in the GMT hand. The second position, you adjust the hour and minute hand. And uh, so that was my second second purchase. And then I got the Laurier at the bottom down there. That's a true GMT or a, a traveler's GMT. And that one is where the first position adjusts the hour hand and the, um, it also adjusts the date, by the way, as you go around twice, uh, it will adjust the date. And then the second position adjusts the GMT hand along with a synchronized adjustment of the minute hand, hour and minute hand. So um, anyway, the point of this was I found the Borealis the easiest one to use. I, I got the Laurier and then I went to go set the date and I was like, man, this is, this is taking forever to set the date. I have to go around and around and around. Now I was using the second position because that's what I was used to. Did not realize that the first position was a slightly faster way of doing this because the hour hand moves faster around the, um, around the dial. Um, but the bottom line is, is the only way to change the date is to circumnavigate the globe basically. And that is to go around and around and just keep changing the date until you get to it. That's a major difference between the, the Traveler GMT and the Caller GMT. So then I went back and I, I was using the Borealis. And I was like, wait a minute, this is way easier to set the date. Yeah, the time, the hour hand, minute hand is a little bit more cumbersome. And that, that's where you're, you know, you're moving those around. But man, this is way different. So I found myself gravitating towards the Caller GMT. And you'll see that in the video. I'm not going to give you all the details here, but... For me, I think the GMT, and for those that are out there watching this, uh, whether it's live or you watch this after it's been published, but what I would like to know is what your preferences are when it comes down to the GMT. Do you prefer the caller GMT? Do you prefer the traveler GMT? And then the second question is, <clears throat> my curiosity is, um, what is your travel habit? What are your travel habits like? Are you traveling a lot of the time? Are you traveling little? For me, I don't really travel much out of the uh, Kind of the Western time or the mountain time zone in the United States. So I may go back to the central time zone um, and maybe occasionally go into the uh, Pacific time zone because frankly, the Pacific time zone is like two and a half hours away. So if I go West at all, um, you go through Idaho, which is the panhandle and, and you're into the, the Pacific time zone. So I, I do get a little bit of that, but to me, that's not GMT worthy. I mean, I can figure out what the central time zone is and what the Pacific time one at hour minus an hour. That's not a big deal. Um, but I'm curious for those that, that choose the caller or the traveler GMT, do you use it because you do a lot of traveling? Do you use it because you don't? Now, when I have relatives or friends in other places, um, I love the GMT because I can look at it and say, yep, I, this is this person is sleeping right now. Do not text them. Do not email them, whatever. Don't bother them. Don't try video chatting with them, that whole thing. So for me, I think the caller GMT fits that mold better. Now, I think for people who are literally themselves moving from time zone to time zone, probably the G, the, the traveler's GMT is the, is the way to go because that uh, that reset time is great. 
But when it comes down to the GMTs, I think that's great. I think something else too, when it comes to the GMT is the hand, the GMT hand. Now I don't have any examples of GMT hands that I don't like because if I don't like it, I don't buy it. Um, but the ones that I have, I think are really good. I'm going to pull up the, the glycine airmen. So this is coming out Thursday, the review or Friday, the review for this one. And, uh, Take a look at that GMT hand. Um, that GMT hand, in my opinion, does a great job of kind of sticking with the overall design of the handset. But at the same time, it's very distinct from the hour hand and the minute hand. And I've seen some GMT hands out there where you have a hard time seeing where it's at because the it's literally a pip at the end. Um, hey, Juwan Lee. What time is it over there right now? For for me, Mountain Time, it is 6.21 or 18.21 p.m. 18.21, obviously, it's p.m. Um, so for me, the 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 GMT hand that has like a pip on the end, that is difficult to read. So when I, I think the Laurier, had, yeah, the Laurier, if you look at that, here, I'll pull up, I think I have a single shot of that one. The Laurier, if you look at the red GMT hand, has that little pip on the end. I kind of lose track of that one a little bit when it's nighttime, especially. And I, this is where the loom to me, I'm, I'm looking at my watch, you know, middle of the night when it gets darker in a room, whatever. And it, it's, it's helpful to have a watch where those hands under loom, when they're loomed up um, are distinguished from the other hands, or in this case, distinguished from the hour markers. So for me, this one is, is pretty good. Um, you've got a good loom ring that goes around the, the Laurier. If you know what the Laurier loom pattern looks like that, that 24 hour, 24 hour ring, that's all loomed up, okay? So that's helpful. And honestly, the GMT uh, PIP is beyond the hours. So it's it's actually a good setup overall, but you kind of get the idea where if you have a PIP on the end of that um, GMT hand, you really want to make, you want to see where that thing ends up. Is it too close to those hour markers? Is it distinguished enough from the hour hand and the minute hand? Is it distinguished enough from the second hand, even though the second hand is moving around? Um, I don't know about you, but when I, when I wake up in the middle of the night, my eyes are not, even though I have reading glasses, eyes, um, sometimes a little bit blurry just from waking up. So just the more distinguishable, the better. So we go back to this GMT hand. It is very different from the second hand. If you look at the second hand pip, and if you look at the GMT hand, very different as far as size goes. If you look at the hour hand and the minute hand, those two hands go together, um, and they're very different from the GMT hand. So Categorically, I think the GMT hands really take a look at whatever GMT hands you've got on your watches now, or one if you're looking for uh, to get one in the future. Really look it over and see what it looks like when it comes down to that GMT hand. Uh, let's look at the Borealis. Okay, now the Borealis. Now that GMT triangle, if that gets over the 12, okay, that 12 is loomed up. Okay, that's where I think things get a little bit dicey because that 12 has so much loom to it. And then you put a, a triangle over the top of it and it's gonna be harder to distinguish that triangle on top of that one and the two for the 12. So just a tip that I've learned over the, the long haul when it comes to the loom side, the darker side of you know looking at a, a GMT hand with loom, um, something to consider. All right, 921. All right, Canada. All right, colleagues from Germany. So, Joanne Lee, where are you like where do you originate from then? If I'm missing something here, from Germany, Canada, Montreal, and other customers. Yeah, yeah. So you're doing jo Juwan Lee. You're doing a lot of traveling. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, that I, man. I, I'm curious to see what you like for GMTs. What's your preference on GMTs? Because it sounds like you're you're going all over the place. Um, Nine twenty one a.m. So that you are. What would that be? I don't even know. Juan Lee, you got to help me out, man. My brain's not working. I don't know where you're at. All right. Um, so the GMT hand, I think it's uh, really uh, Malaysia. Makes sense. All right. So you're, you're not only in the morning, you're the next day. Um, yeah, Juan Lee, you bring up a good point. I'm going to put you up there. Um, this is great. He's in Malaysia. Too bad GMT watches can't solve countries with odd time zones because there's half hour time zones. And I think there's a number of them in Asia, if I remember right. I don't pay a lot of attention. Yeah, India. Um, I don't pay a lot of attention to that, but I do know they exist. And, you know, I'll deal with it when I have to deal with it. But otherwise, I'm not really dealing with it. So, yeah. 
All right. Um, let's see. So, Juwan, Tuesday morning, you're not across the dateline? Curious. You had, you're you on this side of the – is that right? You're on this side of the international dateline? On the United States side of it, I guess, if, for lack of a better way of saying it. So – Curious, man. This is this is turning into a, a, a conversation about time zones specifically. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So back to GMTs real quick, so we don't get too distracted. I'm going to keep going back to Juwan Lee. He's got he's got he's from Malaysia. So I'm. This is kind of a curious question. Does a lot of traveling too. So when it comes down to the set, the the handset that you have on your watch. Keep that in mind as far as um, the distinguishing factors between the GMT hand, the dial, and then also from the hand set themselves. Because the I'm gonna real one more time, when you look at the glycine airmen, it's like, oh, those are kind of close together. And they kind of are, except the GMT hand has this larger uh, pentagonal type shape towards the end. And it's larger than all the loom on the 24 hour or the 12 hour markers. So that's a distinguishing factor there. So when I look at this watch at night, I can definitely tell which hand is which. Um, and then, of course, the second hand is always moving. So it's, that's not a huge issue. And the, the pip on it is kind of small, too. So um, anyway, all right. So GMTs. Now, um, setting the time, this is another one that, that got me um, because I always – in the past, because I didn't use them that much, and I've been using a little bit more, and I've kind of forced myself to, because I have another number of friends now through this channel that are in different places around the world, whether it's in Asia and Africa, um, Europe, and so to me, this is something that that I've gotten used to because I'm starting to use it more. And I think that's one of the things about a GMT. If you're not really going to use the GMT, would you buy one? That's another good question for everybody out there. If you don't really plan on traveling, if you don't have friends or family that are really that far away from you is a GMT really something you, you want to buy or is it more of a, it's just a great looking movement. It's, it's kind of cool. I can do, you know, uh, UTC time if I want. Um, okay, great. Um, but now that I'm starting to use it more often, I think the, the absolute, the use of this GMT time or hand has gotten better, which means setting the time is also different. So, one of the things to consider with the caller GMT is set the time first, then go back and set your GMT uh, hand because the caller GMT, the, the GMT hand is separate from the local time or from the hour hand, the minute hand. So I have to remind myself when I'm doing the caller GMT watch, set the local time first, then go set the GMT hand. And then, of course, you can set the date because it's a quick set date. It's just the opposite direction from the GMT hand. And that goes the, the same way for... Um, uh, I'm sorry. I think the, it's backwards in the Laurier. Let me pull it up here. The Laurier, in this one, I it's the only traveler or the true GMT that I have, and partly because I've never really been in high need prior to a few months ago anyway, probably about five, four or five months ago. Um, set the GMT, so go to the second position. So this is the same thing as the caller GMT. You want to set your GMT first, okay? So that's in the Laurier's case, that's going to be the, the red hand. I'll pull that up here. All right. So I'm going to set the red hand first. Then I'm going to go back and set the local time using the hour hand. Okay. Now, when I set the GMT hand, I'm also setting the minute hand. Okay. Remember, the first position on a true GMT is only moving the hour hand. That's the only function in the first position is to move the hour hand. It also does the date, too. If you're going around twice, you're going to change the date. Um, which reminds me that the, if the date is really important to you, like make sure you get that date right, you know, as you're spinning around, whether it's the first position or the second position, um, you can set the date with either one of those. Um, it's faster to do with the first position. But as far as the order goes for the caller GMT and the traveler GMT, go through and set the time or set the GMT, the second position on the caller GMT, uh, set the time first. So that's the, that's the order to go as, as far as I know. So second position and then first position. That's the, the easy way to do it. All right. Uh, let's see here. Let's check in with some of the comments going through here. All right. So GMTs, I like them. I think it's something that, uh, oh, 
and I haven't finished. I got to talk about the, the Nighthawk too, because the Nighthawk is, is different. Um, but the GMT, I think is something that grows with you. It, it, uh, you'll find uses for it. And I think it's important too, because as you start looking at things around the world that are happening, um, kind of a curiosity, just to set the time on the GMT hand and keep track of it for two, three weeks and then switch to another time zone, keep track of that area of the world. I think it's a, it's a great way to kind of get used to geography as well. Sometimes we get caught in our own little geo bubble. Um, and the GMT hand could kind of open that bubble up for you a little bit. All right, let's talk about the Nighthawk real, real quick. It, I don't have the single picture of it, so we're going to go back to this cluster. Um, but the Nighthawk, the Nighthawk, there's two positions on the crown, just like the other analog watches. The first position, you're going to adjust the hour hand only. Okay. And the hour hand only goes clockwise. It does not go both directions. On a true GMT, it goes both directions in the first position. On, a, on the Nighthawk, it only goes clockwise. If you turn the crown the opposite direction in the first position, you adjust the date. So you get the best of both worlds here. The Traveler GMT, you've got to spin that sucker around like a roulette wheel to get the date. So let's say it's set on the 23rd, but it's actually the 22nd you have to go around 31 days or 30 days to get back to the 22nd. Okay. So first position on the Nighthawk does the hour hand clockwise only. And then it does the date, hand, the date window going the opposite direction of the crown. The second position, you adjust the GMT and basically your minute hand. That's what you're adjusting. Um, so it's really the best of both worlds. You get the caller GMT easy da date set. And you get the Traveler GMT, um, the uh, hour hand moving around. And I got to double check because I think, I don't think I should say that if you go around twice with the hour hand, I don't believe it changes the date. And I'm wrong. It does. Okay. So it does work just like the Traveler GMT. But you can go back because <laughs> you can go back the opposite direction with the crown and you can change the date. So even if you mess up the date while you're doing that, you can just turn the crown the opposite direction and go back and correct the date. So to me, the, like the Nighthawk, I don't know about anybody out there who, is, who has the Nighthawk. The Nighthawk is something special when it comes down to a traveler, caller, hybrid, easier to use, in my opinion, GMT. So the first watch that I got ended up being the watch that is probably the easiest to use under both circumstances. If you're kind of got a lot of people elsewhere in the world, or if you yourself are traveling. So any comments on there, put them down there or share them even after the video is uh, posted. Um, but I'm just kind of curious where you are at with GMTs. Uh, do you have any GMTs? What kind of GMTs do you have? What brands do you like? The handset, do you like the sword hands? Um, the Nighthawk sword hands, I really like those. I think those are great. It's kind of that pilot Flieger style hand almost. Um, the Borealis, yeah, the hour minute hand, it's good. They're kind of that pencil hand. Um, and when it comes down to loom, it looms, you know, obviously from the central, the center pinion all the way out. So it does a great job of loom. So I know what the hour hand is and the minute hand. Got to be kind of careful with that, with watches like the Glycine Airmen, where they, they do kind of the, not the whole hand, they, they do portions of it. Um, sometimes they get to be a little bit too cute with that. And the, the hour hand and minute hand are just too close together as far as loom goes. So, um, but curious to see what you guys have out there for GMTs or GMTs that you're interested in. So if you're watching, I'm curious to see what GMTs would you be interested in if money was maybe not an object, or if you had the money right now for the GMT that what you wanted, what, what, mo what watch would you go get? Um, I'd be, I'm curious about that. I'm kind of set with GMTs. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I'm going to get another GMT, specifically a GMT. If the watch has a GMT and I like the watch and the design and all that, and I'll, okay, fine, I'll, I'll get it because it has, I'm not getting it because of the GMT. I'm not sure that I'm out to get a GMT. I think it's, I've got what I need and it's, there's a variety. I can do the things that I do on, on YouTube, but um, I'm curious to what you guys are interested in out there. If, uh, and I've, I've heard a lot about the Rolex GMT. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty popular. So, all right, moving on. What's next. We had the flashlight update EDC flashlight. Okay. So <laughs> I don't have a slide for, well, do I have a slide? Let me, let me double check here. I have, 
Well, I have part of it up here. I have those two flashlights on there. Okay, so there's the EDC from last week. All right, so I've got two of the flashlights up there. And then I'm going to turn this light on here so that you have a better shot at seeing this flashlight. I might wash myself out when I do this. I look like I have like white cheeks or something. All right, so here is the Ace Beam. All right, the H6. Great flashlight. Rechargeable double A. Use double A's in this if your rechargeable battery goes dead and you're you're nowhere near a, a plug-in. You can you can put a double A in here, just a lower output. Okay, I like that one quite a bit. The one that I've used the longest is the Olight S1R Baton 2. So this is the smaller one. Put it next to the, the uh, Ace Beam. You can see the height difference. Now the barrel on the Olight is bigger. So the battery capacity is a little bit higher, okay? 1,000 lumen output, 1,000 lumen output. Okay, it's a high output double A. It's either 1,000 or 800. It's really close. 800, 1,000, it's really not, it's almost imperceptible if you ask me. I've had uh, weapon lights that are 800, and then my handheld for my duty belt was 1,000. I had a hard time telling the difference between the two, okay? I'm sure there's a difference. So, all right. So those are the two that I've been carrying quite a bit. Now, the curiosity came up a month ago with the Nebo Swivel, okay? So this guy was out in the open last month, and I was going to try this, okay? And the reason for it was because it was so similar in size, almost, to the Olight, okay? It's a little bit taller. Now, when this is straightened out, it's obviously almost twice as long. It's about 40% uh, longer, okay? And... This this flashlight, if it was just a little thinner, if this rotating head, this was the thing I brought up last month, if that rotating head was installed on this light, winner, winner, chicken dinner. This this to me is the bomb at that point. I that's that's what I'm looking for. I want an adjustable rotating head on here. So if I have I'm backing up a trailer or whatever, I can I can magnetize, put this on something metal, and then I can rotate the head around and get a better shot of light wherever I need it. Okay. So I went online and I thought I found it. Okay. And it was a two for one kind of thing. I paid for both. It wasn't like it was free or anything, but you pay for both. And it was Olight. And the, the, the free one was this double A battery. It's, it's all right. It's nice. Rechargeable battery in here, tail cap, tail cap on and off switch. I don't mind it. Two way clip. Okay. So that kind of came with it. And I saw the image of this, and I was salivating over it because I had heard people talking about it. This is the Arc Flex. I've been seeing this on the, the YouTube interwebs all over the place. Okay, a little flatter design. Okay, so to me, it's it's about mm, almost half the thickness of my baton. All right, let's just say it's about forty percent less as far as diameter goes. It's wider. Okay, it's wider this way, but I didn't realize how long it was. So I bring up the ace beam up here, and this is the the issue that I have with the arc flex. For putting this in your pocket, you're going to be you're putting something that's really long in your pocket like that. I just don't. I'm not so sure that's the case. Now it does have the articulating head. It does move the head back and forth, and it's stiff enough where I, this is not going to move on its own freely. Um, thousand lumens, rechargeable magnetic base cap or clip or magnetic base to it. It's not, a, it's not a cap. It's just a magnetic base. But the one thing about Olight that I'm not real thrilled about, um, is the proprietary charging cord. You got to have the magnetic cap charging cord, which I, I don't know how many times I've forgotten to bring that with me, um, on outings, excursions, whatever. And it's like, I have a battery pack with me. I can charge it, but I can't because I don't have the proprietary cord. So I'm not a fan of that. That's why I went back to that ace beam. This is kind of the cat's meow. If they could get this to articulate, that would be an awesome setup. Um, all right, we got some stuff going here. Nice. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, changing the diving bezel to a 24-hour marking bezel. Yeah, easy easy way of doing that. And that was before I got the, an official GMT. I had the, the Nighthawk. Before I got the official GMT, that was exactly my strategy, Juwan. I was looking for that. I wanted a 24-hour bezel that you could rotate around. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. Then I got two watch from my...
Yeah. Yeah. AliExpress has got some, yeah, I'll put this up here. This is great too. Um, AliExpress has got some great options. Um, and they use the Seiko NH34, which is a great movement. Um, that's what the Bore, the Borealis has an NH34. I love it. And accuracy wise, it's almost as accurate as the high beat movements, like the Salida movements or the Eta movements. So I have no issue with the Seiko NH34, 35, 36, 38. So those are, in my opinion, if you if you have a little bit of a mechanical intuition or, or touch, you can you can do a little bit of regulating on there and get those dialed in to right around 10 seconds or under 10 seconds a day. And uh, it's a joy to have those because they're cheap, um, easy to work on if you have to, if you want to, or replace. So, yeah, great. Great. So any other ideas out there, if you guys are, are watching, um, curious to see what GMTs you have, GMTs you want to have. All right. So the arc flex, I don't know about this. You know, um, I thought when I, when I heard about it and when I looked at it, I thought this kind of flat design was going to be the design for an EDC flashlight. The issue is it's wider, you know, you don't give up a lot. Um, or you don't gain a lot when you when you go with something like this. Um, it's also got two LEDs on here, which I don't know if that's necessary, but uh, yeah, it's it's bright. You know, it's a thousand lumens. I think it's just a thousand or just over a thousand lumens, so it's bright, and it's got a lot of battery capacity. So for sure, this is going to last a while. Uh, two way clip on here, um, but I you know it's I don't know. It has the magnetic base to it. So it, it's going to do its thing. So I'm going to hang on to it. I'm going to use it, give it a fair shot. But uh, it's just, I think it's going to be too big because I have, <laughs> this is kind of funny. When you look at these two, here's the Nightcore. What is this one? The MT21C. This is what started it all. Okay. So my, my carry or my duty flashlight was basically this flashlight without the articulating head. Okay. And it had a tail cap uh, actuator in the back. I saw this one uh, after I got my my duty flashlight and I was like, ah, the magnetic tail cap, that'd be kind of cool. And then it had the articulating head. So for me, I think that was, uh, let me put myself up here. Where are we at? Here we go. So for me, this articulating head was, I think really, that was a game changer. I'd use this, I started using this for backing up when I couldn't see very well and add, you know, a thousand lumens behind you is way better than any backup lights you're going to have on a standard vehicle. So that's what opened my eyes to this whole thing. And uh, I've kind of kind of uh, stuck to it from ever, ever since. But the magnetic base is really, that's a non-negotiable. It's got to have magnetic base. It's got to have at least 800 lumens. It needs to have a non-proprietary charging cord. That's what I, the Olight, you know, folks, like get over it. Go get, you know, the USB-C and do it right and uh, help uh, help us consumers out a little bit because it's just frustrating. I don't think I'm going to buy another Olight as a result of that, especially if they have, well, I won't buy another Olight that has a proprietary charging cord. If it has a Type-C, USB-C, I'm in. Um, I'm, I'm going I'm switching over to USB-C, so whatever I have, it needs to have that. I'm getting, I, I don't really like the micro anyway because you got to, you know, you got to have the right visual acuity in low light conditions to not force that, trapezoidal plug in the wrong way and, and bend something. So, and I don't know if anybody out there has done that. I've done that before too. So, and then you just ruin it because now you've bent something on the inside of where you're, what you're charging. And so now the thing that you're charging is, is probably not going to charge. If it's not going to charge, it won't ever charge again. So um, flashlights, I'm still looking for that flashlight. Here's the prototype, almost prototype. It's something like this, but with an articulating head. Double A size battery that's lithium charging, so you get a high output. Eight hundred lumens, I think, is what the max is, or maybe maybe it's six hundred. I don't know, but it's it's bright. But with an articulating head, something I can put in the pocket. Um, if Olight had something just a little bit taller than this, but with an articulating head and a USB plug, I'd be all over that too. So that's the update um, on the ultimate EDC flashlight. I got kind of close and. Uh, We'll see. I'm going to keep keep looking. Um, just a couple of reminders for everybody out there. Um, the website is up, and uh, I'm going to talk about next month. I've got something on there that uh, for those that that are looking to do something um, to enable me to do something different with the channel, um, I've got a different uh, link on there 
that I'll talk more about next month. I'm still trying to finalize some things, get some numbers down and get everything set up correctly. It's generally there um, and it's active, but at the same time, I'm just going to go back through it one more time before I actually make a public, um, I don't know, public display of it. So, um, but the, check out the website. I'm going to try to update some more things on there. I've got uh, videos that I'm rolling out and rolling in some newer videos on there. Live streams, I'm putting up new links, but I'm starting to fill the page up with links that are a few months old. So those are going to start to rotate out. The store, I just put up a, new, a few new uh, watches on the store. So that is, um, that's going to be different. I've got a helm on there. What else do I have on there? Um, an Islander. And there was, I think, another one I put on there. I've got a couple of Casios I'll probably put on there. So some of that stuff is going to start to rotate through. And uh, like I said, I've got a few. Oh, I want to talk about one more thing. Yes. Back to the GMT. Oh, this is oh, it's too bad. I don't have anybody on right now. But for those that are watching this post, post live, yeah. So when it comes to travel, I'm going to plant a seed in people who are watching all the way through. And if you're watching all the way through, you're special. And I'm special in a good way. Um, the Casio DBC32. Put this into your memory bank. Pun intended. This watch, I think, is probably one of the best travel watches. Now, I'm going to make my case real quick here, and then I'm going to do the review of the watch, and you're going to see it. All right, so I'm going to pull up my everyday carry, and uh, you can see it's right there in the center. Something to keep in mind about this watch. When, when I'm traveling outside of – I live in Montana. If I travel outside of the state of Montana, I'm wearing this watch, or I will have it with me in my pocket – nearby like i'm wearing this watch it's gonna be very close nearby and the reason being is that it has a data bank the data bank has uh in this case i think it's 32 spaces for names and, and phone numbers whatever you want to put in it frankly you, can, you don't have to put phone numbers you can put whatever you know the, the code to your safe uh your social security number healthcare insurance numbers all of those numbers that you really don't want to share i'm kidding but for phone numbers like um let's say you're traveling out of the country embassy numbers okay put the embassy on here um put uh reliable taxi service on there put your bank information as far as the caller information on there not bank account numbers or passwords but the place that you can call because if you lose your wallet or if you i'm sorry if you lose your phone and if you have all your contact information in your phone like i do then who am i going to call now if i lose my phone and my wallet now my cards and my phone are gone how am I going to get the number to call to, to put a hold or, or cancel my cards? This is one of the best accidental things I've come across. And I, I'm sure I've not, I'm not the first one. Like a, this is the wheel being reinvented again for the thousandth time. But when it comes down to wearing this for EDC, I think this is one of the best EDC travel things that you can have. Now, would I wear this around Montana necessarily? Probably not. You know, I know enough people where I live and, and that, and, I could probably make my way through. Um, but when I'm traveling out of state or if I'm traveling out of country, I am definitely having a watch like this. Now, I have two of these. I have an HTC 700, which is a little bit more of a G-Shock looking deal, analog digital. Okay. But you, this is a data bank, HTC data bank, right? DBC 32, another data bank. So a little bit of a spoiler on what's coming up with the uh, – Casio calculator watches. I've got uh, I've got a couple of them coming up, and uh, it's it's going to be fun. But as far as travel goes, and I'm just talking, we were just talking about uh, you know GMPs. You also have dual time, so you've got the data bank, and you've also got dual time. So now the downside: no water resistance whatsoever. Like you don't even want to wash your hands with this. Now, the reality is if, if you get splashed a little water on here, I think you'll be fine. But the the code from – or the code, the uh, instructions from Casio is no water at all. Okay. So, bummer. Now, um, but I think for travel, it's going to be hard not – hard not to, for me not to bring this watch, uh, this or the other one, um, because of the insurance numbers for my business insurance, um, health insurance. And th these are phone numbers, by the way. Health insurance. Um what else? Oh, local law enforcement. If you're going some, let's say you're going out of country and you, 
you need to call local law enforcement, your phone is gone, have the local uh, law enforcement number on there. Um, there's a whole bunch of things, I mean, bank phone numbers, um, credit card phone numbers, uh, embassy phone numbers, um, friends nearby. If you have, let's just say that you're not going to go visit them, but you just, you enter those names in there so that you have a way of contacting somebody. If you're traveling out of state, like you're traveling from Montana to who knows, Iowa. Um, if you have any friends or relatives in Iowa, put their phone numbers in there. Um, that kind of thing. So I think as far as travel goes, that's a, that's a huge plus. So, all right, we're going to wrap this sucker up and uh, put the comments down below. If you're watching this post live stream, uh, what kind of GMT watch do you like? Um, what kind of movement are you preferring? Uh, ideas like that. Any other EDC stuff, just a reminder out there, send me EDC photos of uh, whatever it is that you carry in your pockets, or maybe it's just your watch, whatever. Um, I think it's just cool to see other ideas that are out there. And uh, if you go get handcuffs, make sure you get the key and practice, 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 practice on a willing participant. All right. With that, we'll catch you guys later. We'll see you next time.